Welcome to our TV show, Operation Freedom. Each month we interview a veteran who tells about their experience. I'm your host, Brad Bradshaw. Our sponsors are Freedom Museum, VFW Post 7589 Manassas, and Vietnam Vets of America, Chapter 617. Today we're very pleased to have as a guest, Jerry Martin. He lives in Prince William and has been married for 40 years to Sandra Lee Idings of Manassas. They have two adult children, J. Martin III and Virginia Lee Zachary. Jerry's from Louisiana and graduated from LSU before entering the Marine Corps in May 1967 when he was commissioned as a regular officer. Before we go into his service career, we'll, have to, we'll discuss his most recent career as a teacher and a coach in Manassas City. Jerry, you recently graduated from Manassas City System after 20 years. And my experience with you, my early experience, you brought large number of students in Freedom Museum for the education. You had a great program there. And, and uh, you brought some individuals over, and you worked with Freedom Museum and everything. Tell us about your 20 years of teaching before we go into the military. Well, it was a little short of 20 years. It was a little over 18, 18 Brad. Okay. Uh, but I guess I'm very fortunate that when I retired from the Marine Corps, I was able to come back to where my family had uh, grown up and to teach uh, and also to coach uh, in a sport that I was always involved in, both in high school and college, and that was track and field. And it was a very rewarding experience. Uh, but I have to also say that one of the motivations for teaching uh, was my previous career in the military. You know, I realized very early on as a young man uh, that there is a tremendous amount that young people have to contribute. And of course, uh, the Vietnam experience uh, tragically cut some of those opportunities short for young people that I knew and was very much impressed with by them as individuals. Uh, and I always remembered a young guy uh, by the name of Jones uh, who had been wounded with us and as we were getting ready to evacuate him on the helicopter, he looked up at me and he said, Lieutenant, uh, where are we? And of course, at that point, I really wasn't sure whether he was starting to go into shock or not. So I was really trying to downplay the seriousness of his wound. And I said, Jones, you know where we are. We're in Vietnam. And he said, no, Lieutenant, where is Vietnam? And that always kind of stuck with me, that here was a young guy who may very well die and not know where he was going to be when he died. And I said, you know, if I can change that kind of a perspective when it comes to making a difference in young people's lives so that they at least know what's going on in the world, especially as they become involved in the events uh, that surround them, not only in their own country, but because of our involvement in international politics, that I wanted to somehow become involved. And I think that was the motivation for me to be a teacher. And I always, in the back of my mind, remember Jones uh, yeah. and that day in September of 1968 when he asked that question, where are we? Good question. And you work both the mind and the body. You were a good coach, too. You went to state on some championships, too. I did. I was very fortunate. I had uh, one state champion uh, in high jump, and I also had one state champion in the uh, 800 meters wow. uh, when I coached at Osborne and was fortunate enough to every season advance at least one athlete to the state championship. So I feel very good about the fact that young people have not changed at all as far yeah. as wanting to excel yeah. and to achieve. And I think the Marine Corps uh, certainly had a lot to do with my philosophy that the word can't uh, wasn't something that I accepted very easily and hopefully I was able to impart that to young people that when you say I can't do something maybe it's because you haven't tried hard enough. Yeah. Well good. Well, thank you for all those years of good teaching and everything. It was remarkable. And I say you're going to be missing the school system for us because you've got a lot of veterans in. You'd bring, 
also as a fact would you bring three or four in special days where we talk about our experiences and that was always good it's getting harder and harder to get in school because standard of learning but you sure you got us in and thank for all those good times we had well i think i benefited as much from teaching as young people did uh, <laughs> from listening to me because i was uh, always impressed with not only the curiosity of young people but also uh, this sense of eternal optimism and hopefully oh, yeah. teachers that come after me will have that same fulfillment. Oh, yeah. Good. Uh, we'll go back to the early time in your life and, and uh, you come into the Marine Corps. Now, you, um, you tell me you had to get your degree before you got your commission. You got your degree. And I had enlisted in the up. Marine Corps Reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, and fortunately for me, uh, a young major uh, stopped by the reserve center prior to me going to boot camp and asked me what I was doing there. And I told him I was waiting to go to boot camp. And he said, well, what are you doing right now? And I said, well, I'm a student in college right now, but I'm getting a little disenchanted. I realize that, you know, I may want to do something else and maybe refocus. And he said, well, before you go, let me give you a test. And I said, well, what kind of test are you talking about? And he said, well, <laughs> He said, I'd like to just kind of give you a test for the officer program. Uh, well, I didn't know what an officer was any more than I did uh, PFC <laughs> at that point in my life. Uh, I took the test, and I guess fortunately for me, I scored well enough on the test that he said, you know, I think if you're willing to do this, you can stay in college, and once you complete college, you'll receive a commission as a second lieutenant. Well, I didn't realize that the life ex expectation for a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps wasn't much different than it was for a PFC in the Marine Corps, but it sure <laughs> sounded a lot better at the time. <laughs> Good. So, so you got your commission. Okay. In May of 1967, uh, when I graduated, uh -huh. uh, I graduated wearing a Marine Corps uniform and received uh, a commission as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. I'll be darned. Um, so you obtained your degree, and um, you uh, this is the Vietnam War is staring in, in your face. Now you had you had did you have some programs uh, training for you went What was your training right after you got your commission? Well, I came here to Quantico, Virginia. Okay, uh, and that's where I met my wife Sandy. Okay. Uh, I came here to Manassas several times, uh, like most young guys do, uh, just kind of looking around to see what the community was like and uh, I met my wife and we started dating and about five months later we were married uh, and then uh, I was at Quantico in officer training at that time and then when I completed officer training I took another test <laughs> fortunately I scored well enough on that test and I got to stay around another uh, few months and I was sent to Vietnamese language school Neat. And so when I finished Vietnamese language school, I was assigned back to Louisiana as an assistant officer, selection officer, recruiting young people again to go into the Marine Corps, which was a pretty tough thing to do in 1967. There yes. wasn't a lot of people uh, that were anxious to go to Vietnam. Uh, and I got to uh, spend a couple extra months again, uh, and then we got married at the end of that tour uh, in, in New Orleans, and then I was sent to Camp Pendleton en route to uh, Vietnam in the 1st Marine Division. Okay. And you arrived uh, in country, what, what month you arrived? There? I arrived, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, May 31st, 1968, I arrived in Vietnam. And I arrived uh, at a place, immediately sent to a place right outside Quezon Combat Base to a company who had just been involved uh, in a very serious fight in which uh, they had been attacked by a North Vietnamese regiment uh -huh. and the company had suffered 60 uh, losses in the company out of 200 men. So it went from 200 down to 140 men. Uh, there was only one other officer in the company at that time and it was a young lieutenant by the name of uh, Jim Jones. Uh, and I was the replacement for one of the lieutenants who had been wounded uh, two days previously. So I was immediately thrown right into the Vietnam War. Good Interestingly grief. enough, uh, 
uh, Jim Jones later uh, went on to become four-star General James L. Jones, uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps, and then the first Marine uh, Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. And uh, Jim Jones retired last year as a four-star general and the Supreme Allied Commander, the same job that Dwight Eisenhower had held. Wow. Um, that, that's so I was in good company. You were in good company. <laughs> now, when you said Quezon, I got a little chill on there. Explain to the audience how important Quezon is, the Din Ben Pu of, of the war for us. Quezon uh, was a very isolated marine outpost uh, in the northernmost part of Vietnam. Yeah, show the map, please. And Quezon was right here at the very edge of the DMZ. That's almost, almost next North to Vietnam. The, it was, yeah. and almost in the country of Laos, right on the border of Laos and the border of North Vietnam. And so we were the farthest marine outpost, and really we were the farthest northernly uh, positioned American forces. As a consequence of that, uh, General Jap, uh -huh. uh, who had been the hero of Den Ben Pu, uh -huh. decided that he was going to use the same tactics that uh, against the American Marines at Quezon that had been successful at Dien Bien yeah. Phu. And he besieged Quezon from around December of 1967 until April of 1968. Uh, and one of the last battles of that particular siege involved my company, uh, Fox Company of 2nd yeah. Battalion, 3rd Marines yeah. in May. Uh, and so after that battle and a few other smaller battles, uh, the North Vietnamese withdrew from the Quezon area. Right. And you had B-52s even running strikes to help We had, <laughs> and funny you should say that, because uh, the B-52s would run uh, their arc lights, uh -huh. and which is interesting because uh, we called them rolling thunder because <laughs> of the sound that they made. Right. And, of course, that same rolling thunder now uh, is echoed by the thousands of motorcycles that pour into Washington, oh, yeah. D.C. Yeah. Yeah. in May of every year. And so that's kind of, you know, my recollections <laughs> of rolling thunder. Yeah. But those B-52s would drop bombs so close to us that they literally bounced us off the ground as we watched them. <laughs> Drop bombs and you're glad to hear him. <laughs> and you better believe I was glad to hear him. Now, you d you weren't wounded there. You, you got I was wounded very close to there at a place called Cam Lo, which was south of south of that. In fact, interestingly enough, could you show you a picture uh, of yourself there? By the way, this is what I looked like after having been in Vietnam for about uh, three months. <laughs> <laughs> so I went from a very clean-cut college kid to this fellow here. It's a warrior there. <laughs> uh, in August of 1968. I was wounded August 15th, 1968, yeah. uh -huh. and I believe this picture was taken August 13th, 1968, <laughs> two days before I got wounded. Gosh. That's pretty much how I looked at the time. Impressive. Well, I don't know. I, I went from weighing 154 pounds to when I got out of the hospital after being wounded to 116 pounds. So I don't know if it was impressive. <laughs> <laughs> but that was before you wounded, though. That was this was before I was wounded. Yeah, yeah. okay, you were full weight yeah. then. I was probably about 140 pounds there. <laughs> That's right, though, all that yeah. heat and everything. Absolutely. And talk about a young man there. Now, that relates to, were you all... Well, this is later. Oh, it's later. Uh, this okay. is my radio operator, uh, Max Grooms. His real name was Muriel, mm -hmm. but like most young guys, the name Muriel really wasn't the name. It's like Sue. That, <laughs> exactly. And so uh, he said, no, call me Max. And so mm -hmm. we called him Max. And uh, Max was a great guy. Mm -hmm. uh, Max, unfortunately, uh, uh, was killed tragically in November of 1968 by a 250-pound explosive device. Good grief. But he, Max has always been one of my heroes and always will be. Okay. Okay. Um, let me go on here. Um, so you, so after Quezon, 
you um, you wound all. I'm moving forward. After case, oh, you wounded and taken out, and you, I was wounded in August of uh, 1968, mm -hmm. and I was evacuated. Uh, spent some time in the hospital, and then I returned to uh, the battalion. And at that time, I became the company commander, and I remained the company commander until December of 1968. Mm -hmm. uh, Max was killed in November. Uh, and he was my radio operator. I wasn't there at that time. Uh, and I, I guess I've always been very thankful uh, that I wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, tragically, uh, there, there have been times that I wish I were, and there may might have been some difference, and maybe Max might not have been lost. Uh, but there again, I realized that mm -hmm. I was normally right next to Max as the company commander because he was my right. communications with the battalion headquarters. But I left, uh, I left the company and uh, was sent back to our battalion headquarters as the operations assistant. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't like the job, I'll be quite honest, because it entailed being down underground in a bunker. And I remember I complained to the battalion commander that, you know, I didn't really come to Vietnam to spend my time in a hole in the ground. And so I went to see one of my old battalion commanders who by that time was working for the division operations officer. And I asked him if there was something I could do. I said, can I go to the reconnaissance? Uh, mm -hmm. Battalion, and he said, "No." He said, "That's not a good idea. You're a first lieutenant now, and all you're going to be doing as a first lieutenant is probably listening to the radio, uh, because normally your teams are sent out in five-man teams, and so uh, you're not going to be any better off than where you are." And I said, "Well, there must be something I can do." Well, about that time, a colonel by the name of Michael Sparks came into uh, the office and overheard the conversation, and he said. Uh, would you consider flying, Lieutenant? And I said, sir, I said, I'm not a pilot. He said, no, we're looking for people who have been on the ground and have fought the ground war yeah. that can ride in the back of airplanes, yeah. uh, talk to the people on the ground, and understand what they're going through on the ground, and really serve as an aerial observer and while you're there, we'll teach you how to run mm -hmm. uh, airstrikes and artillery missions from the air, uh, and you'll become a uh, forward air controller airborne. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what does that entail? He said, well, it basically means you just got to be able to sit in the back seat of an airplane, uh, keep your lunch down, and pay attention to what's going on. And I said, do we get any extra money, Colonel? <laughs> And he said, yeah, you'll get about $100 a month extra. And I said, well, that was better than the $50 a month I was looking forward to as far as jumping out of airplanes. I said, I'm willing to try it. Yeah. And so I became uh, an on-the-job uh, trained uh, aerial observer beginning in December of 1968. Okay. Before we get to that, I'm going to go back a little bit. For When you got your wound, yeah. you did get a silver star from that, but um, that was uh, awarded sometimes later, but I'm, I'm going to... It says you're a captain, but this was a lieutenant when you were wounded. And you got I was wounded as a first lieutenant. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to just read part of it. The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Silver Star Medal to Captain Justice M. Martin II, United States Marine Corps, for service as set forth the following. And I'll just read part of the citation. For conspicuous, conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action while serving with Company F, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marine Regiment, connecting with combat operations against the enemy in the Republic of Vietnam. On 15 August 68, Captain, then 2nd Lieutenant, Martin was commanding the point platoon of a search and destroy mission when he and his men were ambushed by a numerically superior enemy force entrenched on a riverbank. Although wounded in the left arm, Captain Martin bravely led the assault to the area and killed three enemy soldiers who were closing on his unit and some more details and everything. Um, and you were badly wounded out of that and, uh, and some others... That was that was excellent one we just talked about. I didn't want to get past that when we were talking well, about that. Well, you know, I don't like to dwell on the fact that people are killed in war. I think that day I'm more proud of the fact that I saved two men Good. than the fact that I took three men's lives. Yeah. Uh, both of those men 
are alive today. Good. And I think that's important. Uh, one was one of my uh, fire team leaders, uh, a young uh, Marine by the name of Jimmy Harris, who had been shot in the knee and also the ankle. Uh, and we pulled him out of the river. And as we were coming back across the river, uh, as we had broken contact, my other radio operator, uh, Chris Chentry, uh, was shot in the back. Good grief. And I realized that he was the last man. And Chris and I had developed a very close relationship as far as being friends as well as me being his platoon commander. And Chris had uh, called my wife uh, when he'd gone on R&R &R in Hawaii. Uh, and I was very grateful because he was kind of this link between home uh, and myself. And then when I saw that he had been wounded, uh, I realized that somebody had to go back and pull him out of the water. And he was in the water. It was and deep he water. was in the water. It was about waist deep. Good grief. Uh, it was waist deep. And I'd had my rifle shot out of my hand at, uh, when I was wounded, so I, mean, I didn't have a rifle at the time. But I realized that Chris had to come out of the water. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I got Chris back ashore and, uh, and was able to get Chris out and the other three Marines that had been wounded besides myself. There were really five of us wounded that day. Uh, and fortunately, none of us died. Good. And uh, to me, I've always felt that that was the most important thing about that day. Good. The fact that five Marines came home. I want to mention that was good. I want to uh, catch that before we got too far. Now, got you into flying. Show the aircraft. You've got a photo of the aircraft, please. Well, uh, we started sure. off, as, as I said, because I was being trained on the job, uh, flying in uh, these smaller that was a airplanes. Piper jumper, right? <laughs> exactly. It's what you and I know as a Piper Cub. Piper Cub. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. Yes. And I would literally hang out of the. Uh, uh, the window of the airplane uh, trying to see uh, enemy soldiers through the trees and through the jungle, which wasn't always easy, uh, yeah. but the pilot did a very good job of flying at treetop level yeah. to give me that you opportunity. You had your own chauffeur. That's a good part about it. You're right, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I didn't always go where I wanted to go, and yeah. the problem with having a chauffeur is they sometimes have their own ideas of where they want to be. <laughs> Uh, and most of these fellows who were our pilots had flown jets uh, wow. uh, before, so they had this fighter pilot mentality right. that meant that they were going to fly at treetop level and uh, <laughs> tried to fly the little Piper Club the same way they had flown the A-4s and the F-4s. And you can see that sometimes we got a little too close because... Uh, the hole that I'm pointing to is really only about three feet from where I sit, and that's a 50 caliber machine gun hole Gee. that went through the airplane. So a 50 cal would take you down real easy, correct? A 50 cal could take this airplane down very easily. Yeah. yeah. And I think after this particular mission, I reminded the pilot of that because uh, he didn't seem to quite realize that at the time. What's your normal altitude when you fly? Uh, that well, the normal altitude was supposed to be a thousand feet. However, <laughs> he was most of these guys wanted Good to fly grief. at around two to 300 feet. So yeah. you can see that we were just above the trees, yeah. especially the trees in Vietnam, because many of them uh, with the triple canopy right. were 100 feet as far as off the yeah. ground. No margin for error. No margin for None. error. None. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Good looking at that flight suit there, though. <laughs> Well, you had a very interesting mission there and involved... Uh, oh, by the way, here's the Silver Star. We, we, we'll talk about it. for the audience. Here's Jerry's Silver Star here in the case. You should be able to see it right here. Um, you involved in Ashaw Valley when you were flying with a mutual friend of ours. And uh, yes. tell about Wesley Fox, please. Well, uh, in February of 1968, uh, the 3rd Marine Division launched probably one of the more successful... Uh, interdiction operations along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And that operation was called Operation Dewey Canyon. I remember and, Dewey Canyon. And it involved uh, inserting the 9th Marine Regiment, uh, portions of the 1st Arvin Division, uh, elements of the 5th Special Forces, and 
subsequent to that, the 101st Airborne at a place called Hamburger Hill. In February of 1968, uh, the weather was very bad. Uh, it was at the end of the monsoon season, uh, and we weren't very successful as far as providing the air support that the Marine Corps has traditionally been able to provide as ground forces because we just couldn't get fixed-wing aircraft or helicopters or even the small airplanes like I was flying in down into the Ashaw Valley. And as a consequence of that, the Marines literally had to walk through the jungle and the mud and the rain and search and destroy the enemy. And during that time, uh, Wesley Fox's company uh, ran into a, a fortified bunker complex. Uh, and I didn't know at the time, but one of my basic school classmates from here at Quantico was his executive officer, a lieutenant by the name of Lee Heron. And so they were involved in this very intense firefight, uh, and we were able to just break in uh, for a very short period of time, run some fixed-wing aircraft, drop some 250-pound bombs. These are fighters going in there. Fighters yes. and napalm. Okay. And as a result of that, we were able to assist them in overcoming the bunker complex. Mm -hmm. But regrettably, my classmate Lee Heron was killed uh, in the action. Now, Lee was awarded the nation's second highest medal that day, and that was the Navy Cross for heroism. Navy Cross. And, and, of course, Wesley was a Medal of Honor recipient. Was, was awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions right. that day. Mm -hmm. Bobby wrote a book with the Marine Artillery. Rifleman. Rifleman, Marine Rifleman. Yes, we, uh, we go back a ways, too. And you do, too, with him. Okay. Um, you flew 120 combat missions. That's a lot of missions. Now, you didn't go over to fly, and you ended up flying 120 missions. Well, you're right. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because... Uh, we flew two missions a day mm -hmm. as, an, uh, as a reconnaissance squadron. And I remember as I was getting ready to rotate back to the United States, the squadron commander came up to me and said, Martin, uh, have you ever thought about going to flight school? And I said, not after <laughs> being over here. That's the last thing I want to do, Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a bunch of uh, air medals on us. You had to... Let's see. I had them written down here. I think um, I received 22. 22. Air medals. 22 yeah. air medals. I believe so. Good grief. And a Bronze Star for Valor. These are some other medals for the audience. A Bronze Star for Medal, 22 air medals, Accommodation Medal, and of course a Purple Heart uh, for wounds. That's quite a. I think the Marines got their money out of you that tour. And so you wrapped up flying the 120 missions. And then you came, went back and you sat back and did. A year Sunday. later, I, a year later, I. Uh, I wavered my overseas control date to go back overseas. Uh, and uh, instead of going back into ground combat, I was uh, signed as the executive officer of the Marine Detachment on board a gunfire and cruiser. Yes. Okay. And you're off the waters of Vietnam, so you've got two full tours in combat. I had two overseas tours. Full yes. tour. Gee, uh, we, we've... Um, had a fascinating evening talking to you here. Things are moving very fast. We've just got very little time. I just want to, some reflection on Vietnam. We've got about 30 seconds of reflection on Vietnam thoughts. Well, I think there's a song that pretty much sums it up, Brad, and that is, I'm glad I went, but I wouldn't want to do it again. Yeah, yeah that, that captures a lot of people. <laughs> well, I want to um, thank the Service America. You did double duty, so to speak, with two tours, and I could spend another half an hour with all the other stuff you did. You retired as lieutenant colonel and went into teaching. And I want to thank our sponsors, Freedom Museum, VFW, VFW Post 7589, and Chapter 617 for sponsors. And to our viewers, we've uh, had a good year together. Look forward to this next year. Thank you for your support and encouragement. And this, I'm your host, Brad Bradshaw. Thank you for being with us today wherever you are.